I was in Nicaragua talking to a, a banker there, a Christian a Presbyterian who uh, had uh, gone into micro lending, you know, small loans for uh, peasant people, help with their little businesses. Uh, I said, well, how, how are you working with the churches uh, here in Nicaragua? And he, skirt, he skirted the issue a little bit. I said, no, I'm really serious. How, how is that working? He said, Bob, there are whole sections of our country where we can't do any micro lending at all. He says, those are the areas where there's a concentration of U.S. church partnerships. He said, my people say, why do we want to borrow money? They give it to us. He said, why do we want to borrow money to build a church? They build it for us. And then he got very sober and he said, Bob, they're turning my people into beggars. I had the Consul General of Honduras. They have an office in Atlanta, the southeast region. A, uh, a lawyer on her staff had given her a copy of that little toxic charity book. And she called, she said, we got to talk. Got together. And she said, in Honduras, we have 15,300 NGOs, nonprofit organizations, NGOs, mostly US funded. She said they're absolutely ruining our country. Unintended consequences to rightly motivated charity. Well, why aren't the poor being lifted out of poverty? Well, there's some reasons. <coughs> For one, uh, we've been evaluating the wrong things. We've been evaluating how it affects us. On our mission trips, we've been evaluating, has this been a life-changing experience for our young people? Did the group, did they bond? Was it meaningful? That's all about us. It's good for our church, mobilizing volunteers. That's good, that's about us. We haven't been asking the question, how has this activity been positively impacting those we went to serve? Is leadership, uh, is that increasing? Is the quality of life improving? And been asking those questions. And then there's been a, an embarrassing misappropriation of kingdom funds. When Hurricane Mitch swept through Central America, particularly hit Honduras hard, uh, blew down thousands of houses. Uh, there are groups from all over the country that went into Honduras to, to rebuild houses. At the cost of about $30,000 a house that Hondurans could have rebuilt for $3,000. <laughs> One college group during their spring break went down to to paint an orphanage in Honduras. We love to paint. <laughs> the amount of money that they spent on that 10 days was enough to hire two Honduran painters to do the same job, hire two full-time teachers for the school, and provide new uniforms for every student in the school. We already said that that kind of one-way <coughs> giving in increases dependency. It also erodes a work ethic, and it certainly does kill entrepreneurship. Those are not things that we intended. The good news, that's bad news, right? The good news is, that a new day of accountability is dawning. The church is beginning to ask the right questions. We, we've got a little language now that we can use. We understand what is toxic. Toxic charity is doing things for others that they have the capacity to do for themselves. That's toxic. So we're getting away from that. And so we're, we're looking at how do we create new models of service? How do we actually enable the poor to move out of poverty. 
methods of exchange like we talked about earlier. Christmas stores. Churches all over the country are starting Christmas stores. Sometimes they're partnering with uh, an elementary school in their community to do that. It's, it's happening in this moment in history. Micro lending, you know, that's, uh, that's been a very important tool for, for the poor. Mostly in developing countries, those, those small loans that, that help somebody increase the size of their small businesses. But what we're discovering is that micro loans, as important as they are, do not help people move out of poverty. They enable them to live at a higher level in poverty, but a micro business does not create wealth. It's as much as you can do with the efforts of your hand. Wealth creation uh, to the business guys in here means bringing it to scale. That's where we create wealth. And so for a, uh, for a woman in Nicaragua who is making tacos, and uh, she gets a micro loan that helps her to buy a larger oven in her home that she can increase the number of tacos that she and her daughter can make and sell on the street. That's good, that's important. It helps them achieve uh, a little more in life. It eases some of the grinding poverty that they live in. But for her to bring that to scale, well, that brings it onto the radar screen of the government. And now you have to, uh, you, you, you've got to fill out a lot of forms. You've got to do payroll deductions. You have to pay taxes. You have to have an accounting system. You've got the health department to worry about. And now you've got marketing and packaging that uh, for, for markets beyond your own community. You see, that's a quantum leap. That's a quantum leap for somebody that just knows how to make tacos. And so those in, that, are, that are engaged in micro enterprise, it's the economy that keeps them going, keeps them alive, but it doesn't allow them to thrive. <coughs> You know who knows how to bring things to scale better than anybody else in the world? Are sitting in our pews. In our country, we do that better than anybody else. It's called medium, small, medium enterprise, SME. And the SMEs in this country constitute 50% of our GNP and 80% of our new jobs every year. We do it better than anybody else in the world. We are, we are a land of entrepreneurs. So a buddy of mine uh, in Atlanta, uh, he imports Pier 1 type furniture, you know, and sells it. Most of it comes from the Pacific Rim. He got really frustrated back a few years. Timely shipping, it was difficult. Quality control issues were, made it difficult. He said, I can, do, I can do better than this myself. So he and his wife went over to the Philippines, bought a piece of land, and set up a little, little manufacturing operation over there. I saw him at a Christmas party this last Christmas. And I said, Bill, how is uh, how's your business going over there? He said, it's going well. Well, it's just hard work. He said, uh, he said, we're doing well. They said, how many folks you got working for you now? He said, right at 3,000. <laughs> he said, yeah, we, uh, we set up factories in, in three different villages now. I said, man, that, that must be having a, a real impact on the economy there. Well, he said it is. He said, that's 3,000 3, jobs. He said, that, that's created at least 3,000 auxiliary jobs, you know, folks that are that are now uh, selling food to the workers. A uh, guy that had the bicycle, now he's got a rickshaw on the back. Now he's in the taxi business. Uh, so it's created a lot of other jobs. He said, I'll tell you, he said, we've had to, we've had to do health coverage. He said, folks were coming to work uh, shaking and sweating from these tropical diseases. He said, you can't run a factory that way. <laughs> and so he said, we had to, we had to hire a doctor and 
uh, get health care uh, for our workers. It's just good business. He said, and moms were coming. They didn't have anybody to, to watch the baby. Well, you can't run. You can't run a factory with little kids around. They, so we had to start start daycare. And uh, and then a lot of the kids were just, uh, they were going to school, and most of them were just kind of dropping out. So we said, look, why don't we go ahead and scholarship the kids of every, every worker that we have for 12 years so that every one of them can graduate from high school. We can afford to do that. And so every full-time worker has a a full scholarship for their kids through 12th grade. He said, you know, these practices are starting to, other employers are starting to look at it, they're starting to catch on. He says, it's making a difference in the way the economics are working and the employee benefits. He said, we're, we're raising the bar. He said, we've also started a couple churches <laughs> one man, one man with entrepreneurial instincts who wants to do well and he wants to do good at the same time, will impact an entire region. The quality of life in an entire region as well as the spiritual vitality, one man that we could be sending missionaries into that same area from now uh, until the cows come home and never see that kind of change. We gotta change the paradigm if we're going to see people move out of poverty. 